close this one down quickly. And we'll talk about the EXRC1 uh, and the 570 communicating with each other. So let's look at this application for CAN bus master. I'm going to go online with this and we'll take a look again at the HMI and we'll see what's going on here. Okay, so here is the HMI, let's put this over here, of the controller. We notice there's a couple things. First off, communication okay. Second off, we have a set of inputs and an analog input. And we have a set of outputs. What you can't see I have in front of me is my 570 connected to an EXRC1, again, the remote expansion module adapter, uh, connected to a DA8 RO8 which is an 8 digital in and an 8 relay out module, and then connected to an AI4AO2, which is a 4 analog input and 2 analog output module. I can control the relay outputs on these modules if I select these buttons here. So as I click them, I'm turning the relays on, and I click them again, I turn them off. It's a simple toggle. Uh, if I had the inputs wired up, I could turn them on, and I could we would see here that they would go high. And I have a 5 volt, uh, about 5 volt analog input on the analog input side of the AI4AO2. And that's what we see here. Okay. So, uh, again, if I remove the cable, we should see communication OK. Turns to COM error unit 2. We don't have communication to unit 2. And the analog input's gone down to 0 volts. We, we don't want to get a, a false reading, basically. So we, uh, we also turn off all of the digital and analog outputs um, connected to the EXRC1. We don't want this I.O. to go uh, out of control, basically. We don't want anything on that we can't turn off under some control. So everything turns off on the EXRC1, and we need to make sure that the messages sent from the EXRC1 are also 0 to the 570. Okay, so I'll plug this back up. The relays are back to the state they were when we unplugged the cable, and we received the latest value from the analog input, uh, which again is just a solid 5 volts. Okay, so I'm going to close this. We'll take a look at the application for the 570 first, and then we'll look at the EXRC1 application. So if I go to main module, you notice we have two subroutines in the main. Click on main first. Uh, and so exactly what we should expect to see if we're doing communication. System bit 2 is a power up bit. PLC network ID, in this case the 570 is ID 1. And our common initialization for Unican. Okay, again, 500 kilobits, Unican. Okay. Now our second function block is a check live function block. This is checking to see that we have communication with the EXRC1. Every half second we should get a message from ID2 and we'll pulse MB4002 high for a scan. Uh, and this time we're running a 1.1 second timer. Okay, we'll see that after we miss three reads now, uh, we'll go high. Okay. So I'll plug this back up. Now, this example we're looking at is the standard program that comes with the EXRC1, and I made a, a slight modification to both to include an analog input value. So along with displaying the message, no communication, uh, we're going to store zero in the MI4. And we'll talk about that uh, after we talk about the EXRC1. But basically, this is the register we're receiving the analog input to. If I don't receive I.O. communication, I want to store a zero here uh, to signify. So let's take a look at the output side first. Uh, you'll notice that this subroutine 
Uh, we, we'll start by taking a look at net 7 and just explain what's going on. Uh, MB0 through 7, these are the buttons we had on the HMI. They're going to toggle outputs 160 to 167. This is just so we have some example data. Okay? Uh, and in our system, we actually can work with outputs 160 to 167 and uh, link them to the output on the EXRC1. Okay, so again, our information on our outputs is output 160 to 167. Take a look at the top of the program now. There's a, there's a couple things going on, so to talk about this linearly is not going to make too much sense, uh, but after we take a look at all the functions, uh, I think it'll be a little more clear. Uh, so first off, we're doing a compare. MI1799 compared to zero. Uh, what is MI1799? Well, we see the description status. We know that we're working with the status for the send. But if we want to see, we can right-click find MI17799. And we'll bring up in our display in the bottom. Uh, of course, net one is the one we're, we searched for. And we see net six as well. Unitronics can, uh, I'm sorry, Unitronics can send. Uh, net six, our unit can send. We see the status messages from this unit can send block. Okay, I only point out this find feature because it's very helpful to deconstruct a program uh, that we haven't seen before. Okay, so we're comparing the status message to zero. We're seeing if there's a message waiting to be sent. If there's no message waiting to be sent, we're going to uh, drive MB4011 high. In net two, if 4011 is high, we're going to run this struct, struct command. Now, we haven't talked about this. Um, we can find under vector struct here. Uh, and let's take a look at what it does. Now, if you noticed, the only values, the only registers that we were able to select with the uni unican send function block was memory integers. Now, this might seem like a limitation at first. You say, what about my system bits, my system longs, double words, uh, memory floats, every other type of operand I have available to send? Uh, well, the, the unitronics, I'm sorry, the yeah. The unican send function block is designed to send memory integers. In this way, it can send things efficiently. What we can do is package our mixed data types into a memory integer vector. And that's exactly what the struct function block does. You notice that we have a parameter here, copy data direction. We've got two options, uh, from vector to mixed data locations, and from mixed data to, I'm sorry, mixed data locations to vector. What we're going to do is take mixed data locations, and we're going to create a vector from these. So you notice below, outputs 160 with a length of 8. This was our 8 buttons on the HMI, or what was linked to the 8 outputs, 160 to 167. What we do here is link the start operand, and we give it a length, and it will calculate the byte size. Okay, so this whole message, 8 bits, is one total byte. And that should make sense. If we add here one memory integer, I'll just select the next available, and I say 1, we should see it's 2 bytes. And that should make sense. Memory integer is a 2-byte uh, operand. Okay, I'm going to just get rid of this one. I don't want to change anything. Uh, notice after you make a change as well, you can hit compile before you can hit OK. It's just going to make sense, sure that the vector you're trying to calculate makes sense. Anyway, we're going to save this to MI1800. If it was mixed data up to 16 memory integers long, we would save to MI1800 through 1815. Okay, And this is how we're going to enable us to create packages to send with our send command. Okay. Uh, alternatively, the from vector to mixed data locations, because we package this in such a way, on the receiving side, we need to give the same scheme of operands and lengths, and we'll go from a single memory integer vector to all our mixed, our mixed uh, uh, data types. So we can save uh, outputs to the outputs. We can save bits to memory bits, longs to longs. Uh, we just need to make sure we define these structures the same. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to read them out right. It's, it's basically just parsing the information and putting it in the correct places. Okay. So that being said, the important part here is outputs 160 to 167 are being stored in memory integer 1800. 